it is just a privilege to be with you today. I bring you greetings from our church in the USA, Faith Baptist Church. My pastor, Pastor Kurt Skelly, was able to be with us here last year, but not this year. Then I did bring another friend of mine, Nathan and Carrie uh, Owens. They just flew to Durban, and he's speaking in a church down there this morning, but they were able to be here yesterday. And we we're just so excited about what the Lord's doing here. Um, I actually got to attend Benoni Bible when I was a young child. I grew up in Croydon, Pempton Park. In fact, I was saved um, as a young boy uh, there on number five, Theodore Lane, Croydon, Kempton Park. My brother shared the gospel with me. Uh, my dad was a preacher, but of course, if your dad's a preacher, you don't listen to him so much. Um, but my brother shared. I was a good thief and a good liar. I went to a uh, creche in town and then to Crestlawn Primary School. And uh, the class next to ours was making these little cars out of empty toothpaste boxes and i was just sure that if i could have my own toothpaste box my life would be complete i would want for nothing all my my desires would be met and so i stole a toothpaste box from the other class because our class wasn't doing that cool project i took it home i was i was not caught i was i could get away with things but do you know, as a young boy, God began to wake me up and convict my heart. That is wrong. That is wrong. That is wrong. And do you know, the pressure was so great, I took that toothpaste box back and said, I've taken this. I didn't know how to get rid of that. I didn't know what to do with that. But as a young boy, as Paul says in Ephesians 2, and you hath he quickened. He's made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. And I don't know where you are in life, but my friend, there must be a day, maybe today, that God wakes you up and he lets you know you are not right with God. God is holy. You are not. And Jesus makes the difference. And you know, my brother shared the gospel with me. And I remember standing in that house and in my heart crying out, I believe this. I believe this. And my friend, the gospel is that simple. God sent his son to die for your sins. He was buried. He rose again. And as the apostle said, believest thou this? Will you today again affirm your faith? Yes, my faith is in Jesus Christ alone. He died for my sins, was buried, rose again, lives evermore. And so the gospel, I got saved not far from here. And my father was a church planner. And then I met my wife. I'm so glad she's able to be with me on this trip. This is my wife, Julie. We've been married 20 years this year. And then our youngest of three children. I'll just ask Catherine to wave just a little bit. She's very small. Um, but I'm so glad she is able to be with us. All three of our children were born in Emma Plenty. And uh, we got to serve there for 16 years. Uh, Rocky didn't like me uh, when we first met. He was pastoring in Middleburg. And he, had the, he had the nerve to show up at our church. He showed up, didn't tell me he was a pastor in the neighboring town, and then left. He visited that Sunday, and I didn't even know afterwards. Somebody told me, you know who that was? No, I didn't know who that was. And, uh, but over the years, we got to meet eventually. He put up with me a little bit. And then we got to start serving together. And I've just enjoyed not only his, his love for people, his love for God, but his love for the word of God. And I know, Benoni, I know that he preaches way too long. I know that. I have talked to him about that over the years. When he preached at our church, I didn't let him preach that long. And so I apologize to you. I've tried. I've tried. Brother Henny said he's now leading you astray and you're preaching long too. And I will endeavor to preach less than an hour. And I think you're not used to that. Um, I usually preached 42 minutes. I don't know why, but it's always 42 minutes. But uh, just Brother Rocky, thank you to you uh, for the privilege of letting me share your pulpit, to Maxine for hosting us again in your home, but to Benoni. Let me just tell you what you did yesterday let me explain it from a pastor's point of view. 
when you're in the ministry, you don't go for for continuing education usually. If you're in a specialist field, whether it's teaching or engineering, you go to workshops, you go to classes, maybe you're a mechanic, you could get certified again on something. My brother's getting certified on another plane now. That's what happened yesterday. Because in the ministry, we get together, as they did in the New Testament sometimes, and we have to train one another in our own field. And that's what happened yesterday. Yesterday, you provided ongoing education, ongoing certification or continuing education credits, if you will, for probably at least 60 ministry leaders, pastors, pastors, wives, and, and much more those who serve in the church. You enabled and you invested in at least 30 other churches that they could get education, understanding, equipping, so that they could go back to their churches. And when you invest in that, it's not just so we can eat a piece of cake and go home and pat each other on the back. No, we take from yesterday and we are challenged, encouraged, we are exhorted. We, we leveled up our understanding, our education. Oh, I didn't know about that. I learned that. And so we mutually benefit. But you enabled that to happen. And so thank you. And it's not lost on me that it was a large financial investment on your part. That it wasn't just your labor of yesterday. You have labored for weeks and for months. And I know Rocky drives a hard bargain sometimes. And he says, I need this and I need this. And you did that. And it, it, it went far. There were many yesterday. It was the first time. And I overheard conversations. Some who came yesterday were genuinely very weary in wealth. And they were challenged to keep going. Some were frustrated in ministry, not knowing how do I do this? Even, even voice that, their frustration in ministry. And they got to hear from Brother Miles or, or Brother Nathan. Oh, thank you. I did not know how to do that. And so as a church, thank you for hosting us. Thank you for providing for us, for enabling us to have that conference yesterday. And, and from the bottom of my heart, we say thank you. This morning, I'd like to look at three passages as we ask one question. Why bother with church? We're going to look at a few places. If you would find Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, we'll come to that as our second text. Ephesians chapter 4, we'll be there for the majority of our message. Uh, after a brief introduction, we're going to be looking at John chapter 4, the gospel of John. I just want to draw your attention to a, a sentence that Jesus said in John 4. You can listen or if you want to find that place as well. But we'll be in Ephesians chapter 4. And then at the end of the message for our application, I'd like to draw our attention back to the very first church, the very first church gathering in Acts chapter 2. And so usually we, we will try to stay in one place, but I would like to look at those three passages this morning um, as we try to ask this question, why bother? Why bother with a church? Let's pray and we'll ask for the Lord's help. Father, strengthen us from your word. May you quicken us. Uh, Father, give life as we, we know the Word of God is living, it speaks to us. We know that when we read the Scriptures, God in heaven, that you are speaking. These are not merely the words of men, but that they are the words of God. The holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So God, you are speaking today. Open our ears, open our hearts. As you said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart. Lord, encourage, reprove, rebuke, exhort. God, we do not know the need. I do not know the need. I, I hardly know even the names of your people this morning. There's no way I can know uh, the situations. And, and Lord, we, may, we ask that you would even apply your word very specifically, intuitively on the topic at hand, but also on the need of the lives present today. Lord, in our nation, and I say South Africa, my nation, born in Africa, raised in Africa, ministered in Africa, and what a privilege to be back in Africa. Lord, in our nation, there is so much confusion about the church. 
And so give us some help today from your word that we can remember, thus saith the Lord, this is why we have a church. Lord, thank you for Benoni Bible Church. For the life, the new life you have given it. Many pastors have served overseas and, and now many people here today. But God, we thank you for this church, the work you are doing in this church, through this church, with this church, even so that as it did in Thessalonians, the Thessalonian church, so that from, from you, the word of God sounded out. And it's doing that even this next week as, as Benoni also sends some of its leadership to Cape Town to influence down there. And Lord, this church is sounding out the word of God. Help us today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Why do people go to church? Why? Because they like the pastor or the pastor's wife, maybe. They like the music. They like that the service makes them feel good. Maybe they have friends and family who've always gone to that church. That's my church. They could care less who the pastor is or the music is, but that's where we go generationally or in breadth. They go all together. Maybe because they feel weak during the week. And so they come on Sunday for a bit of a religious pick-me-up, and they just feel good. And you know what? It should be good to come to the house of the Lord. Even David said in the Old Testament, he said, you know, it's good. He said, it's good. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my Lord. You know, and so the idea that we should find some, some emotional, spiritual stimuli from the church, that's not bad. The pastor should not have a goal of just making his people feel bad. No, the idea is that, that it should be good, uplifting. I am strengthened. I'm challenged. I'm fed. It should be a meal. When I work with young pastors, I say, your job is to become a chef. Study the crop. Learn to set the table for your people. Feed the flock of God. That is your task. Young st uh, Sabello in Emilatlani is now, he was in the youth and now he's teaching the adult Sunday school class. I was so proud. And he is becoming a professional chef. He's going to culinary arts. He's getting his master's degree, but he's also becoming a preacher. And I said, yes, feed the flock of God. And so you should come and be fed and left full and, and feel that I've gotten something. But why do people go to the church? I have found that, that there are some new kinds of church people. And let me just say, Pastor Rocky has not given me the role of, of Benoni and said, now watch out for this one. I don't know you. And he hasn't asked me to say anything or preach. He's given me no guidance. This is what's been on my heart. And many of these things I shared with our church a few years ago when we still served at Faith in, in Whitbank. There are all sorts of people who attend church today. Uh, that's not to say that everything that is new in church is bad, nor is everything old good. Just some of my own anecdotal observations, sometimes church traditions are often we become not just tradition, but traditional, so that everything that old is somehow sacred. And perhaps in older generations, duty, loyalty, dependability were commonplace and core values of our generation, and the older generations seem to just get that. Ah, they got grit, you know. Now in the new generations, we seem kind of soft and pansy. We don't know what it is to just buck it up. But sometimes in the old ways, form was more important than substance. And you could have the form of godliness, but could deny the power thereof. As long as you look good. You can cuss and swear and sleep around on Monday, but on Sunday, <laughs> we look good. We know how to do church. Being right sometimes was valued more than being spiritual. But then this new Christianity comes in and, and we want all spirit, but truth just doesn't matter. And we want to feel good, but, but responsibility and duty is almost like a four-letter curse word. And so each generation wrestles with its own difficulties 
and one expression of church in one generation is not necessarily appropriate in the next generation. And because the Benoni Bible Church is not simply a self-styled NGO existing to serve your spiritual need. No, it is the church. It is the living organism. It is what Jesus Christ said he died for and he loves. He says, I will build my church in Matthew 6. I've noticed over the years, I'm going to give three different words by way of introduction. And I know this will be long before we get to our text. But think about some tendencies we see in churchgoers. Uh, we see the spectator. And the spectator says, let me watch. Let me watch. Um, I've come for a show. Put on a show and a song and a dance. And I'm evaluating your performance. I'm a spectator because we've become a spectator culture. We like shows. We like movies. That's actually how we become in all of our entertainment. And now we think the church must be that way. So we evaluate the service as it were a show. And if it didn't meet the par, let me see what church down the road has a good show. And I'll see, oh yes, that was nice. And we're evaluating the performance because we are spectators. Don't call me for anything. Don't expect me for anything. I don't want to do anything. I just want to watch something. I'm a spectator. We had, over the years, many spectators that would come in and out. What about the consumer? The consumer says, meet my needs. And that's what we do. It's the client is always right. You know, if I don't like what your service, I can go to the next company. I can switch from MTN or to Vodacom or whoever's got the best deal in town. And I, I, I can also come to the, this church like, you know, like a buffet or a carvery. Mm, I, I like that and I like that, but no thank you, I won't there. And so we treat the church as I'm the consumer and you need to meet my needs. And please post the shopping list of you have this ministry and that ministry. And oh, but I see you don't have that. No, yeah, but you're kind of weak here and let me shop somewhere else because you haven't quite met my needs. And, and should, the, should a church be growing and developing and, and serving the spiritual needs or providing for the spiritual needs of its people? Yes. But we forget that it is the church who provides for the spiritual needs of the church. The leadership leads, but the church services itself, as we'll see in Ephesians chapter 4. So we might have a spectator, we might have a consumer, but then another uh, type of church member or church participant I've seen over the years is the floater. Just don't count on me. I'll be here, but I'll also be there. As we grow in our, in our churches, they grow in their more independent, stylized churches built around personalities or looks or showmanship, people like to belong nowhere. We like to slip in and slip out. And I will tell you, I love doing that myself. If I'm visiting a new place in town, you better believe I come in late and I leave early and I don't fill out your visitor card. We don't like to be known, especially if I'm visiting on holiday. I'm like, I don't want to. But my wife loves to go in and tell everybody, oh, yeah, we pastor here. We do this. I'm like, honey, I just want to get out of here. So maybe that's your personality. But the floater is an unhealthy place if that's how you live. And you show up. And I just like to go around. I had one member, I weren't a member, an attendee one time say, I just like to bless all the churches in town. I thought, actually, you just give a headache to everybody in town because you show up everywhere and cause problems and then leave. This floater. So why bother with church? That's a good question. Thank you for asking that. Let's try to answer that as we turn to Ephesians, uh, but we'll find the first word in a succinct way in John, but let's look at Ephesians chapter 4, if you will, with me. Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 4, the preface of Ephesians chapter 1 and 2, chapter 1 and 2 are very worshipful. Ephesians and Colossians, are they mirror each other in many ways. They talk about Christ and the worship of Christ, and he opens up in Ephesians chapter 1, and he, he blesses God. It's like a doxology almost. Bless God, bless God. And Ephesians chapter 2, he says, you should bless God. He says, he says, you are God's poem. In the King James, you are God's workmanship. 
and he uses words of a tapestry and of a poem that God is writing your story. You are God's poem. You are God's tapestry that he's weaving. And it's just worshipful expression of, of God is good and God's work in your life and he's doing great things. And so the first few chapters of Ephesians are very worshipful and God-focused. And Ephesians chapter 4, he turns it in on the church. And my home church in the U.S., this is the text that uh, my pastor, Pastor Skelly, would, would go through as he goes through our starting point class. If you're becoming a member at Faith Baptist, we have a six-week uh, lessons that go through who is he, who are we, who are you. And on the portions about the church, he talks about the ministers of the church, the measurement of the church, the message of the church, and the, some other M of the church, the, the membership of the church from Ephesians chapter 4. This is one of the best texts about why bother with the church. Let's look at verse 13. We can pick up in verse 11 where he talks about the ministers of the church that he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. You'll notice at the end of that phrase, the leadership of the church is to equip the saints so that the saints can do the work of the ministry and so that the saints can edify the body of Christ. It is not a one-man show. Why? Verse 13, the measurement till we all come in the unity of the faith of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man to measure the stature of the fullness of Christ. Why? That we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Why bother with a church? I want to leave with you four, four or five statements about what is the purpose of the church. Why does Benoni Bible Church exist? Number one, only Bible church exists, number one, for the collective worship of God. The collective worship of God. So when we meet together for this morning, it's actually not about you. It's not about me. And we, can, we do bring in all of our baggage, all of our problems, all the things of the week and this morning, and we kicked the cat on the way out and we slammed it a finger in the door, and we yelled at the wife, and we ran through a red light, and when we get here, we're supposed to worship God. And that's why we intentionally structure, even from the scriptures, music, and the idea we're singing, and we're collectively turning our thoughts and our hearts, and, and that's why Rocky doesn't style the order of the service because that was his idea. That is what they did in the New Testament, and the order of a service has been prescribed, the components of it, for millennia to draw our hearts away from this world to the reflection of our God. Why? Because Jesus said in John chapter 4, he says, God is seeking for worshipers. One famous writer said was, missions exist because worship does not. That the purpose of the church is to collectively call men and women to worship God. Notice what he says as I turn your attention. You can listen. If you want, or if you have found John chapter 4, he succinctly places it here before the instruction or the, the foundation of the church. Jesus draw the, draws this, this core truth of, of his mission in John chapter 4, where he speaks to the woman at the well. Jesus speaks to that Samaritan woman, and she's worshiping in another form, in another place. And he says, Jesus said unto her in John 4, verse 21, Woman, believe me, the hour comes when ye shall neither in this mountain, in Samaria, not Jerusalem, nor yet at Jerusalem, worship the Father. And notice he says, you worship, you know not what. We know not, we know that we worship. Now, is Jesus being racist here to say that the Jews are better than the Samaritans? No, he's speaking the truth in love. 
Not that the Jewish people had all truth, but God chose to reveal himself through Abraham, the people of Israel, gave us the prophets, gave us scripture through them. And notice what he says, verse 23, but the, the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks, he's looking, he seeketh such to worship him. And he reiterates, says it again, verse 24, God is a spirit. So God is not a white man. He's not a black man. He's not a blue man. He's not American or South African. He's not, God is not Jewish. And so that's why this, like the, the idea that we need to worship, we need to be, if we act like we're Jewish in our worship, we're going to get closer to God. God is not Jewish. Jesus came as a Jewish man, but God is not Jewish. He is a spirit. The great spirit. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Why does Bononi exist? For the collective corporate worship of the God. God wants worshipers. Now, I, I know you say, Pastor David, this, this isn't real deep. I know, just hang with me here. Uh, it doesn't get any deeper. I'm just going to go back and say what he just said. These worshipers must be spiritual. They must be spiritual, but they must also be truthful. Now, we tend to be one or the other or like one more than the other. And maybe that's because of your personality. Maybe you're just a feeler. And so you just like to feel. I just feel. Well, that's not all bad. God gave us feelings. But maybe some of you, you enjoy more of the analytical mind. Yeah, but this isn't right. And, and you, you like to read the scriptures. Yeah, but the Bible says this, and the Bible says this, and you love truth, but you're just obnoxious. Yeah, and we have both in the church. And Jesus said, God wants us to be spiritual and truthful. In America, she's been famous for many decades as one of the most spiritual women in all of America, Oprah Winfrey. But she is one of the most godless, wrong women. But she is very spirit, spiritual. She's hungry. She's hungry for spiritual experience. But that spirit must be lined up with truth. There are a lot of spirits, but they're not all of God. And so Jesus says our worship must be in spirit and in truth. That's why we exist. He does not say these are the instruments you can use. Why? Because worship is not music. Sometimes we call it a worship team, or I don't know how you call or name things. And that's fine, this or that. But the worship service, the entire service is the worship service. The corporate prayers, the reading of scriptures, the public singing, the public testifying, bringing a prayer request. That is the corporate worship service of the structures, uh, of the, the service, which has been given to us, done and exemplified throughout scripture. And we do that still today. How it is styled, there's almost zero in scripture about that, except that it'll be done decently and in order. But as to instrumentation, and whether it's men or it's women, and I don't know if you've had fights over that, most churches do. Most congregations have very strong opinions about that, sometimes generationally, sometimes background experience. But let me just re say again, the scriptures speak very little as to the style of that service, but it must be worship towards God, all the components of it, the readings of scripture, the prayers, the public declaration and explanation of the scriptures, and we worship God. Your church has autonomy and must decide what is appropriate for your time, your space, and the people that God has brought together. And you determine that, and it will change. And it would be arrogant for one people group in this service, whether it be by generation, ethnicity, or background, to say that your personal taste should then trump the entire church's decisions on that. And so we give and take. I like generational music, old songs, new songs, various expressions. I wanted as many kinds of instruments as we could get from the audience. Who plays what? 
we need to express, and many of those are found in Scripture, but God wants worshipers. They must be spiritual. The spirit, the heart must be sincere. It comes from the inside, but it must also be tr in truth, grounded in who God is and how he has expressed that he wants to be worshipped and seen through the Son of God, the divine Son of God, who is the mediator between God and man. Why does Benoni Bible Church exist? For the collective worship of God. Number two, why does Benoni Bible Church exist? And we'll, we'll take the rest of these from directly from Ephesians. So one and two expresses worship. It did not succinctly state it like it does in John 4. Number two, we exist for the experiential knowledge of God. And I put those words together on purpose, experiential knowledge of God. It is not enough that a church just inform you about truth. It must be experienced. Truth must have grit. It must have bite. It is instruction so that the man of God may be. It must be experienced so that we learn what we believe so we know how to behave. It is not enough to just inform and instruct. There must not just be the knowledge of God, it must be the experienced knowledge of God. And so in Ephesians chapter four, he says, what are we doing here? He talked about the leadership of the church. I didn't wanna go into that. I just gave you the format of how our church goes through the explaining the purposes of the church. But here he says, notice till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure. Can we measure our spirituality? In some senses, yes, we can. And the Bible does that all over the place. It measures things. In Ephesians chapter two, it says, you need to put off those things. You take off the old man and you put on the new man. It's measured. In all of the churches, there were lots of sin lists. And, and here's the good things list, the bad things list. This is what you should look like. This is what you should not look like. If we learn about God, the knowledge of God impacts who we are, how we behave, how we think, what we do. It is experience. And so the purpose of the church, what it means, it is for the, for the experiential knowledge of God, whether it be in the children's class, the adult class, a ladies' meeting, a men's meeting, a prayer meeting. Anytime there's instruction, whether it's behind the pulpit or in a more informal setting, whether it's from leadership in the church, church members, it doesn't matter. When we are learning about God, it should impact who we are. It is experience. It is experience in a couple ways, through the unified assembly of believers. Hebrews talked about that. The church was starting to fragment and split. And he said, no, don't forsake the assembly of yourselves together. And so that's why you have corporate structural meetings and the church sets its own calendar. We meet on Sunday morning because Jesus rose from the dead. And, and John, even Revelation, talks about the Lord's day. But you know what? Sometimes you can't be here on the Lord's day because you're at work. And I understand that. But there's, there must be set times where the church says we are meeting together. And you can't meet all of them because you have commitments too. But the idea is I must be regularly meeting together. And a local church sets its own service meeting times, gathering. In our church in the U.S., we have we, our, our mission statement for our church is Faith Baptist Church. It's worship, grow, serve, go. Worship as a church, grow in a group, serve on a team, go to the world. And we structure everything we do around those statements. Why? Because we're saying what we're learning about God, the worship, then we grow, then we serve, then we go. These are all based in the New Testament. It's not because we had some brainstorm idea. Ooh, we got something new. No, that, that's just our expression of what the Bible says about the church. Through unified assembly, the entire assembly as much as is possible, and then smaller assemblies. You'll have, whether it's demographic, whether it's age, whether it's gender, it is appropriate to have smaller groups that come out and even meet house to house or in various forms, not to the exclusion of others, but for the unique expression and teaching. There's unique aspects of the knowledge of God that, that this group may need. And so a local church might say, we need to have this ministry to meet this need that's rising up. And so you have, we need to teach the knowledge of God experience for this group in a unique way. 
and the church decides that, and it changes as the need. So the unified assembly through the unified affirmation of our faith, and that is seen publicly in two ordinances, both in baptism, the public profession of our faith in Christ, and the ordinance of, of the communion or Lord's Supper, Nachmal, the idea that we meet together to remember our Lord's death, burial, and resurrection, and we, we take that as our own through the unified and corporate instruction of the Scripture. This is what the church has always done. Your church will decide how you do it, but it must be done. Why does Benoni exist? For the collective worship of God, for the experiential knowledge of God, and number three, for the individual maturity of believers. The individual maturity of believers. What does he say? Till we all come. The idea is you're on a journey, I'm on a journey, but we're all on the same journey. We're supposed to look like the Son of God. Now, I'm not quite there yet. Uh, that I'm not comparing myself to you or you to me. I'm comparing myself to him, and we're both walking there together. And maybe it looks like I've run far, but I haven't run the Comrades Marathon, but, but you know, maybe I started really good in a kilometer in. I'm like, I'm way ahead of you. I'm, that's the wrong comparison, isn't it? Oh, boy. <laughs> That's where I'm going. Notice he says in verse 14 that we don't be children tossed to and fro. What's he talking about? We know our young children, their emotions, they're up and down and they're happy and they're sad and they're crying and then they're laughing. It's the best day ever. I don't want to do it. They're up and down. And, and sometimes church members can be that way. No, we need to settle. Why? He says in verse 15, so that we might grow up. It's time to grow up. We would say that to our children. It's time to grow up. Sometimes God needs to speak that to our lives. Hey, it's time to grow up. And usually you are more grown up in some areas than others. And then we just make fun of the immature ones. Oh, you're immature over there, but maybe they're grown up in another area where you are young. How do we do that? Through mutual accountability, we speak to one another. Through mutual responsibility, we grow up together. Through mutual privilege, we benefit from one another. And he alludes to this, in does it, he speaks to it directly in Ephesians 4, 16. He talks about the whole body fitly joined together. And it's compacted. Why? Every joint supplies. You'll be familiar with the famous body passages in Scripture that talk about the body of Christ in Romans chapter 12 and 1 Corinthians chapter 12, how that there's one spirit, but many gifts, many spirits. We, the body is healthy when it is unique. And so that we don't pick on one another. We're just like, hey, I'm so glad you're different from me because I see what you're good at and I'm not. And we learn to build on one another. It's like, you know, when you're teaching somebody to drive, we moved to, my wife had never been in South Africa. And so when it came, I had to teach her how to drive a stick shift on the wrong side of the road. I've taught my son how to drive it. It's an automatic. But you know what it is when you're learning a stick shift. I remember when I got to college, I worked for the, the maintenance team and they said, they handed me some keys. They said, you can drive a stick. I've never driven a stick. I said, yes, I can. I knew the theory. I was like, I can do this. You know what it is? You know, I want. <laughs> but when it works together, isn't it? And that's the idea here that it's, you know, when the church, it, it, all these gears are different. And if they're not lined up, it's terrible. And you just grind. But when it works together and you learn, here's where I fit. It's a beautiful. Why does Benoni exist? Number four. Number three, the first two are about God, the unified worship of God, the experiential knowledge of God. Then the next two are about believers, the individual maturity of the believers. Number four, for the unified service of believers by believers. For unified servants. Notice he says, each joint supplies so that when you are gifted, it's not for you. Your gift was not for you. I had one guy tell me in a church, you know, he was one of those floaters. He says, well, I, I, I love to just worship God. I think it was the golf course. We always pick on that. And I said, that's impossible. It's impossible. I don't accept that. It's impossible. So, well, I, I, I just get along. My faith is so much richer when I'm not in church. When I'm in church, I get bothered. And I say, 
That's impossible. You are immature. You are a child, sir. Because you only get to grow when you're growing with God's people. They say, but I don't like God's people. I understand that. I don't like people either. I am an introvert. I like to be in my garage with my tools. I want to live far away from people. I, I moved out of town. But I, I do love people for a little while. And then I need some space. But the Henny was really kind to me this morning. He didn't talk to me for two hours. He kept the music down low. And he even said, I tried to even not make eye contact with you. There's a little bit of a joke in our family. It's like, I need at least two cups of, cups of coffee before I see you. Okay, I can talk to you. So whatever your background is, whatever your personality is, the idea is, but I'm supposed to supply something that you need. Every joint supplies. Why? So that the body edifies. Notice, it edifies itself. It is not Pastor Rockies or any other leader in this church. It is not the leadership's job to meet your need. It is your church member's job to meet your need. It is the leadership's job to lead and feed and guide and watch for your souls, is what Hebrews says. But there's no way. Are you kidding? He can't meet your needs. He's a bit odd, isn't he? Does anybody else? He's a bit odd. I love him, but he's a bit odd. There's no way he can meet all your needs. It's not his job. It's your job to meet each other's needs. I remember when we were still, still pastoring in, in, in Whitbank, um, when I came and started early on, we, my dad, his health was declining, but he was still there. So he got one pastor. Then I was new pastor, and then Pastor Sambisa was training. We had three pastors. That's luxury for a church of 100 people. If you were sick, you got three pastoral visits a day. Talk about luxury. Maybe, maybe, that, maybe you didn't want that many. But if you were in the hospital, one pastor would see you at 1030. Another pastor you at three. Another pastor. That's ridiculous. It's like, wait, this is broken. I remember, it, it, for us, the way I, I said, look, if there's a life event, the pastor's going to be there. But it's the responsibility of the church to care for the church. I remember one day I overheard the entire choir, we had a choir at that time. It came in and out. And the entire choir had gone to the hospital to meet a choir member. And they, that choir ministered to that church member all week long. And I can't tell you how that warmed my heart. Not because I didn't have to do work. I still did work. I still checked. But I could see the church is caring for the church. It's your job to meet the needs of each other. Why? How do we do this? The unified service of believers, we do this, yes, through meeting together, formally and informally, not to the exclusion of others, but you'll have private meetings or meet for coffee or each other's homes, but then really through working together. And I watched that all over the place yesterday. And, and he, I even said this to one or two people. I said, you look happy. <laughs> Have you been to a church where people are serving and they don't look happy? That, I tell you, that's what I'm looking for first. Are, are God's people happy? And that's how I measure the health of the church. Are they happy? Yeah. These people like one another. Something's going right at Benoni. They're working together and through increasing together. Notice he says they make increase of the body. If this church does not increase in numbers, it is not healthy. Now, how do we deal with numbers? People are, you know, we count numbers, we don't numbers. Well, it's just bad as long as we're faithful. Fiddlesticks. Jesus said, I want to build my church. And he gave us the whole world. You can't do that unless you have more numbers. We are losing the game, if you haven't noticed. We need to grow. You need to outgrow this auditorium. You need to go to double services. You need to plant more churches. If we don't, we are failing. And it might be that your numbers stay the same, but you increase in other ways and you're, you're sending out 
And, and I remember one pastor said, we don't, we don't measure the success of the church by the, the increase of the numbers, but how many people we send out of our church. Even in healthy splits, plan another church 30 minutes away. But there must be an increase. The book of Acts records and it counts the increases. This many were baptized. This many were baptized. This many were baptized. And the Lord added. The Lord increased many, many, I think six or seven enumerations. Why? You should be counting things. You should measure your church attendance and see, but how many were saved this year? And how many are we winning? Are we reaching our world, our community, our Jerusalem? That is the mandate. If we don't do it, we have failed. You must be increasing. Oh, it bothered me terribly once we kept numbers in Whitbank. I saw we're not, I think we got to a cap. I said, we're not increasing. I was a little comforted when I learned we started measuring that the mining sector, most people were there for a three-year contract. We lost at least 20% of our people every year for economic migration where they moved somewhere else for a job. Oh, I was mad at them. We lost at least 20% of our church every year. So I felt like we're growing, we're growing. People are going to say to baptize, but, and so then I said, okay, Lord, then this is a conduit. And we're going to, we're going to keep sending people out. But the unified service of its believers, why does Benoni exist? Number five, for the intentional evangelism of unbelief. Why does Benoni exist? For the corporate worship of God for the experiential knowledge of God, for, I can't remember all my points, the individual maturity of the believers, for the service, the unified service of believers. And then let's think about this last one, which is not in order of importance, the intentional evangelism of unbelief. That is why we exist. Paul says in Ephesians 4, 1 and 4, 17, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, Verse 1, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye have called. What's your job, your vocation? You are a Christian. Verse 70, this I say therefore and testify of the Lord that ye henceforth walk, not as other Gentiles walk. He says, hey, you didn't learn Christ that way. He touched on the evangelism component specifically in Ephesians chapter 2. For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves is gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. He says, you are his workmanship created unto good works. You were saved to impact this world. He didn't just write your poem. He didn't just make your tapestry so you look beautiful. He wrote your poem. He made your tapestry so you could touch this world for Christ. And I'm going to touch on two points here. Through, first of all, the passive observation of your life. I don't like the term lifestyle evangelism. That's not what I'm talking about. But yes, the passive observation of your life is touched on many times in Scripture that people must see you and your life, although it doesn't authenticate Christ, it does validate something. It does speak. I don't like the phrase, you are the only Jesus people will see. No, my friend, don't put that pressure on yourself. You are never going to be Jesus. But you must speak of Jesus. And when people say, yeah, yeah, but you're not a good Christian, you can say, of course I'm not. I'm nothing like Jesus. Of course I'm going to fail you. You thought I would. No, I can't be Jesus, but let me tell you about him. When they slap it in your face, of course you're going to mess up. Take that pressure off yourself. Let them know that. Did you think anything different? But my Jesus doesn't mess up. In fact, he's been very merciful to me. He's forgiven me. So, yes, a passive observation of your life, I understand that. But we do not actually evangelize until, secondly, there is an actual proclamation. So when I say the intentional evangelization, it means that, yes, your life must authenticate, it must speak well of your faith, but there is no evangelism until we actually proclaim the good news. Jesus died for you and rose again and will forgive you. There must be a proclamation. Now, I know in our church, when I was doing a series on evangelism, our people were petrified of evangelism, and so am I. I get afraid. What are they going to say? What if I don't know what to say? 
I don't have all the answers. And so when I, when I talked through it with our people, I said, if I say, how many of you are willing to go out on evangelism? I mean, nobody was except one or two people. I said, all right, let's do this. We started working through some things. I said, next Sunday, we hand out, I want you to write down your testimony. I want you to say, write down, first of all, what was happening before you came to faith in Christ? How did God introduce himself to you? What happened? And what happened after that? How did you come to faith in Christ? And they wrote it down. That's your testimony. I said, okay, I want you to pray, God, help me to share my testimony with one person this week or this month. And they started doing that. I said, how many of you, you can't maybe proclaim the gospel, thus saith the Lord, but you can speak about Jesus. Oh, I can do that. Good, let's start there. And yesterday, one of the pastors said, how do you church plan? He said, love, love, Je uh, love God. I think he loved people. And he said, speak about Jesus. I thought that's pretty simple. Love God, speak about Jesus. But that is your job. It is not the master's job. It is our job. Sheep reproduce sheep. Yes, you know, faith, many times I was the one who led people to faith in Christ, but it was the sheep that brought others. It is the congregation that evangelizes and increases the church. Why bother with the church? When you start understanding why we are here and what we're supposed to be doing, these are beautiful new chairs, but how the, church, how the chairs are arranged, it doesn't really matter that much, does it? Who leads the singing? It, it actually doesn't matter that much, does it? If a new instrument is introduced or you know, the, we decide to park the cars in a different way or it's something. Yeah, it doesn't matter, does it? Because that's not why we're here. Our calling is much greater. What does God want you to do this morning? For time's sake, and I don't want to be blamed that I went longer than Rocky. In Acts chapter 2, we find the pattern of what God wanted for these worshipers. And the pattern that's given to us in Acts chapter 2 was then corroborated over and over and over in the New Testament church. The New Testament church, it folded out in four phases in the book of Acts. It came to the Jewish people, and it really was a Jewish church for the first eight years or so. And then it expanded in Acts chapter 8 to the Samaritans. And then in Acts chapter 10 to the Gentiles, the Romans. And then in Acts chapter 19 to some Old Testament believers who still had faith but didn't know that they needed to put faith in Jesus Christ. And it's interesting, all four times had a public outpouring of the Holy Spirit to validate, yes, this is true. It was done to the, the Jews and Samaritans, to the Romans, and then also in Acts chapter 19, again, to these Old Testament saints. And so this pattern is corroborated throughout the New Testament, throughout the book of Acts, over at least three decades. But let's look at the first one. And we can say, what does God want for you at Benoni? I believe there are at least four things that God is going to say, this is my will for your life, for every single one of you. First of all, it is to be saved. And it says in verse 41, then they that gladly receive his word. We see that they were added to the church such as should be saved at verse 47. That's what's happening. The word of God is preached. They received it. They put their faith in Christ. My friend, this morning, God's will for your life is that you be saved. Today, right now, will you call upon the Lord in your heart and know, yes, God, as best as I know how, I believe that Jesus Christ died for my sins. God, forgive me, save me, make me your child. Every person this morning, God's will for your life is that you be saved. Notice, secondly, it says, and they were baptized. The New Testament did not know what a person who says, I believe, I'm, I believe, but I won't be baptized. That, it's an incongruity in the mind for the New Testament. Every single time in the New Testament that people came to faith, they were immediately baptized. Immediately. I mean, we could do it in a bathtub today. We're not going to. Our church in America, uh, our baptism is really wonky. 
we got a we got a pool. We, we got, our church is about a thousand people. We got a we got a a pool, and we stuck it out. You know these, not the blow up ones, but you put the. And we baptize in the parking lot afterwards. I mean, it's a, it's a thrill, and people come, and we go out, we baptize, and then we bid them. baptize. It is the public profession to humble myself and say, the old man is dead. I will follow Christ publicly. Yes, I am a believer. There should be baptisms here. I don't know. I have not asked Rocky. I don't know how you do baptisms here, but there should be baptisms often. At our church, we said the first Sunday of the month is Baptism Sunday. And we say, who have we led to Christ? And in the, in the pastoral staff, if there's nobody ready to be baptized, it tells us we aren't evangelizing. We have failed. Now, I know it's God's work, but it's a good reminder to us, hey, it's Baptism Sunday. Who's ready? We, we don't have people ready. Then we've not been doing our job. To be saved, number two, to be baptized, and number three, notice what happens to become an active church member. And it talks about them. They, they were added to the church. It means they were counted. However you do membership, your name should be written down. So who are the members of Benoni Bible Church? Now, the logistics of that are flexible, but every single time in the New Testament, it says they were numbered, they were added, they knew who was on the roll at that church. And it even says when they moved to another church, they sent letters of recommendation. We don't do that because that's the Baptist way. We do that because that's what they did in the Bible. To be saved, to be baptized, to be an active and engaged, involved church member. And it even talks about them financially being involved and regularly attending. They were known. These are the members. And then number four, they began collectively worshiping, serving, and speaking of Jesus. Now, that's pretty simple. It's not rocket science, is it? But that's what the Bible says to the question, why bother with the church? You are doing an amazing job. How do I know that? Because I hear about it. And that's what the good churches in the New Testament, it was voiced abroad. Oh, yeah, Benoni. Benoni. Oh, yeah, did you hear what Benoni's doing? Oh, yeah, Benoni. Oh, we should go to Benoni. Yesterday, I don't know, like, it was, I'm guessing at least 30 churches and people came to, oh, Benoni. Why? Because at some level, you are identifying with what God has called the church to be. And so today is not a stick message. It's a carrot message. Keep going. This is what God says the church is to be. And you have done well. And let me challenge you to do more. Let us close in. Father, we thank you for Benoni Bible Church. And Lord, may you give them many years. Many years. May you give them much growth. Lord, may this church split many times as they send out and send out and send out. Lord, may they increase their capacity here to call worshipers to you. Deliver them from the evil one. Protect them, we pray. And we ask these things in your son's name. Amen.